Welcome to Parallax Views. Paul J of the analysis.news. How are you doing today, Paul? Uh, I'm doing fine. <laughs> Just a little, you know, it's surreal being stuck in front of the computer and every everything going around. But we're doing really okay compared to the kind of suffering we're seeing. So before we dive into some current events and the work you're doing with the analysis.news, uh, for my listeners that may be unfamiliar, I have a lot of younger listeners that are just starting to get more politically active. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little about your work. I mean, you've done a lot. You've done uh, wrestling documentaries, wrestling with shadows. Uh, you've also been involved with the Real News Network. Uh, what's your sort of background and is there a connective tissue uh, behind the documentaries and journalism you've done? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, you know, there was never any grand plan for what I did uh, because uh, uh, partly I, I, you know, I quit high school when I was more or less legally able to at 16. And I went to an experimental school, but that was sort of for a year, but that wasn't too serious in terms of formal education. Uh, so I didn't have a kind of normal trajectory, you know, where you might go to university and have a specific expertise and then go into that field uh, for the when I left school I was gonna go to film school and then I didn't because the year I was supposed to go to film school uh, was the year of the front of liberation to Quebec uh, kidnapped first the Quebec cabinet uh, uh, the British high commissioner and then the uh, Quebec cabinet minister this is 1970 known in Canada as the October crisis and uh, Trudeau declared martial law uh, across the whole country, although it was mostly effective in Quebec. It was all nonsense because there was no, quote, apprehension of insurrection. Anyway, it was so tumultuous that I just couldn't imagine going off to film school in the middle of all this. So I wound up, oh, I drove a truck for the post office for three years. I fixed freight cars on a railroad for five years. And then I got into filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, and then eventually into, you know, kind of journalism. Uh, it's, I guess, just I'm led by my curiosity and I'm led by a kind of drive to try to change the world in whatever way I can. And so, you know, I, I was executive producer of the main political debate show on CBC for 10 years, a daily debate show just kind of fell into that. I just had an idea and pitched it. And so uh, there's never been a grand plan, but the connective tissue is probably a good way to frame it, which is a striving to understand what's going on, a striving to change what's going on. And, uh, and I, because, uh, you know, over time I developed a filmmaking media kind of expertise, I kind of went down more of that road so I guess that's the short answer. I wanted to ask uh, really briefly to, um, and I know it's uh, a documentary you did years ago, but I, I did want to mention that Wrestling with Shadows documentary, not so much uh, to get your thoughts on wrestling, but rather, was there anything you learned about uh, culture and maybe the way people believe in certain things through working on that documentary? I've heard you maybe reference it a few times on the analysis. What do you think you got out of that experience? Well, the film was never about wrestling as such. I mean, I wasn't a wrestling fan before I made the film, and I wasn't, frankly, much of a wrestling fan after I made the film. Uh, it, it interested me because uh, I read an article by Roland Barth, who's a French philosopher, a semiologist, as I was thinking about doing the film. And he talked about wrestling as being a, a, like, like a Greek tragedy and melodrama where wrestling char characters play uh, very powerful, strong emotions. Uh, you know, somebody plays hero, somebody plays villain and so on. And, 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 and it interested me why that was so appealing to a, a large, such a large audience. At the time I made the film, the audience around the world may have been more than a billion people a week. Uh, and, I, and I think understanding the appeal of wrestling in retrospect now, and a little bit then, uh, helps me understand a little better the support for someone like Trump, who actually 
was into wrestling. I mean, he actually was a character in WWE fighting Vince McMahon and so on. And I think that helped to teach Trump something about how to get pop from an audience, which is what, when, what wrestlers try to do. The film, the main theme of the film is, are you naive if you think there are values more important than just making money? And, and Brett, in, it, to a large extent in real life, uh, as, as we made the film, uh, was so involved in, in his character, the hitman, who was a hero and stood for good things, that he didn't want to diminish that character, that hero, uh, and, and the values it's, the hero stood for. Um, and so in a sense, he chose those heroic values uh, over what might have been better for his career. In the long run, you could say it kind of worked out for him career-wise because he got a contract with the WCW um, and made a fair amount of money. Um, but but it was still an idea of are you naive if you think there are values above money making and people can watch the film and decide. So uh, what I got out of the film was a chance to tell a story in a very with pop culture about what I thought was going on in the society and and Vince McMahon represents uh, you know his wife was actually in the Trump cabinet so. Mm -hmm. They represent this hyper-capitalist politics and, and economics, which is because uh, they used to treat these wrestlers. There's a line in the film where they, Brett says, you know, they treat us like circus animals. And that's how they see workers broadly throughout the society. They're expendable. They're disposable. And I got to tell that story as well through the, through the wrestling film. I think that's a really uh, powerful aspect of that documentary because – Really, you know, I, I grew up on pro wrestling. I'll be honest about it. Uh, they've never been allowed to unionize. They're considered independent contractors, even though they're not allowed to do any work outside of the wrestling promotion they work for. And it seems to almost uh, be a microcosm of this bigger problem we see um, with the type of capitalism we have in our society today. I guess that leads me into the question of what was your sort of political awakening on issues related to uh, things like capitalism, uh, the sort of war state, national security state, and uh, economic issues like inequality. Well, I, I, you know, our identities and political formation obviously start, you know, where you grow up. So the, your parents are the first transmitters of culture to you, and then school. Uh, my parents were lefties uh, and and had left. Had, my father was Canadian, mother American, uh, but they'd gone both for different reasons and met in Los Angeles in the uh, late 1940s uh, and during as McCarthyism and House of Un-American Activities Committee sets in. Uh, my father was active with a progressive lefty trade union called Mine Mill. Uh, my mother was an actress, but she got involved in the circles of the Hollywood Ten and they left, I guess, around 1950, um, and because they were probably, one or both of them were probably going to get targeted by the House of Un-American Activities Committee. Um, so they came back to Canada, and, and then I, as a result of that, I was born in Canada. I, I grew up in a household, and I can't say a household that was super political, like, uh, they were, I don't know why, but... They didn't propagandize me, that's for sure. If anything, it was the other way around. But, it was the, but they also didn't transmit Cold War ideas to me. So if anything, I picked up some progressive values from them. I know when I would come home from lunch, sometimes from school, my mother would read me Izzy Stone's newsletter, you know, the muckraking left-wing journalist. And, uh, and I know when, we played, when we'd watch Canada play the Soviet Union in hockey, my father was always, he was obviously rooted for Canada, but he always had some positive things to say about the Soviet team. Uh, although he got very disillusioned with the Soviet Union uh, early in the 50s, actually. Uh, anyway, the point is, I grew up without uh, having been injected with Cold War mentality. And maybe I got a little bit of vaccination 
against it. I can't say I was super political, but I, I was always interested. I started reading newspapers as soon as I could read newspapers. And I once, when I think was eight years old or seven, wrote a letter to Prime Minister Diefenbaker because I read a story in the newspaper how the Inuit, the, the, those, the, those days it was Eskimos, were starving, literally starving in the, in the thousands and complaining, why didn't the Canadian government do something about it? And he wrote, they wrote me back a letter. I can't say he, somebody who works for him, wrote a letter back saying, uh, go donate to your local church, as if the Canadian government didn't have any responsibility for the people starving. And I, it hit me. Anyway, I, I, to make it short, uh, my, I would say the main awakening for me was the Vietnam War, as so many people of my generation it was. Uh, that's when it really became very clear to me what that war was about, Canada's complicity, and it, and it impacted me in ways that resonate today because I never grew up feeling any illusions about the Democratic Party. For me, the Democratic Party was always the party of the Vietnam War, and which also means I'm not like a former smoker when it comes to the Democratic Party because, you know, some people that were smokers are now become the craziest anti-smokers. And so I'm not a crazy, and I, I, or I shouldn't say crazy, I don't exaggerate uh, some visceral hatred for the Democratic Party. For me, it's part of this imperialist empire and needs to be understood as such. But anyway, the Vietnam War, the, then the, of course, the FLQ crisis, and I got into some activism around the Vietnam War and uh, other kinds of left anti-poverty activism and that sort of stuff. So I'm formed during those kinds of periods. And then I got involved in uh, my filmmaking, which was not very directly political. Uh, but I always had that kind of uh, gravitation. And then as I got into doing the debate show and my films, and then you know later with Real News, uh, I felt like I, had, I was in a position that was kind of unique in a sense. Because of the show I did on CBC for 10 years, the debate show, I had real mainstream journalistic credibility, but I had pretty left-wing progressive politics. And not many people with my kind of politics had that kind of mainstream experience, both in television producing and in documentary. Because my documentaries were on all the big networks. I mean, I was on A&E and CBC and BBC and Arte and Turner. You know, I was in that circle of documentary filmmakers that could get their films sold to the big networks. On the other hand, my politics were, you know, I guess quite radical and, and, and still are, but I, the, I don't like using the word too much radical because it means 100,000 different things to different people. But anyway, that's a, a short for, uh, if you want, my awakening. Uh, let me add one thing. Uh, the, the most important person in my awakening is an old guy with a big gray, two old guys with big gray beards. And, uh, you know, Marx and Engels for me uh, were the, uh, and still are, the, the best way to form one's analysis of the world. Clearly they were analyzing the, you know, late 19th century and, and the beginnings of the 20th century, but the methodology of dialectical and historical materialism and what one can learn from Marx and Engels' analysis of capitalism, uh, I don't think is in any way been diminished by time. I'd love to get into that uh, a little bit more later on in the conversation, but something I wanted to come back to was uh, you mentioned that era of McCarthyism and the Hollywood Ten. And now we're seeing a lot of concerns about, I would say, a, an extremely or virulently sort of paranoid style of the American right. Things like QAnon, uh, the sovereign citizen movement, uh, the stop the sale people that, that, that did the Capitol uh, insurrection or, or riots. Uh, and I think that we suffer from this problem that Gore Vidal referred to as... Uh, the United States of Amnesia, where a lot of people talk about this as if it's a completely new phenomena. But I, I think there's a line between things like QAnon 
and that McCarthyism of so many years ago. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, there's a direct line. Uh, the uh, I'm doing now a series of interviews with Matt Trinauer, who produced the series The Reagans on Showtime. And it's hard to find something in the Trump campaign that isn't a copy of the Reagan campaign. On the other hand, the Reagan campaign was given birth to by McCarthyism and that whole era. Uh, the, in 1946 is a, a critical year for uh, the United States. Uh, it's the a year with the most strikes by workers, I believe, before or since. Uh, a real, you know, the workers have been asked to suppress their wage demands uh, during the war. And in 46, it just burst out. Uh, soldiers were coming back from Europe and Asia saying, you know, we were told we're out there fighting for democracy. Well, now that we're home, uh, we'd like some of that. And people understood democracy meant economic democracy, not just formal, you know, vote every two years or four years. And even Roosevelt understood uh, and, uh, that there needed to be it. And he actually had developed with his vice president Wallace and some others, uh, an economic bill of rights that would guarantee employment and other sorts of things. Frankly, things that I believe are quite impossible under capitalism. But it, it, sh it showed that in 1946, uh, people really wanted economic rights, not just formal political rights. And there was another very, very important factor, which is the uh, popularity, prestige of the Soviet Union uh, was very high. Uh, you know, later, I think people found out more that uh, it was far more repressive than people thought. And it's a long conversation, which I don't mind having, but the Soviet Union in the long run was not sustainable as a model, uh, and I think to a large extent, because you, you can't, I don't know how you have a, a complicated planned economy with a pencil and paper, you know, pre-computers. Uh, I think it was more than utopian to think you could do it. But anyway, go back to the 46. This, this year, 46, the, uh, Roosevelt's now dead. Uh, and the New Deal is now something that was a, a compromise with the American working class that a lot of the elites thought was no longer necessary. Uh, America is now the big, powerful, superpower, only superpower in the world. And, uh, you know, OK, we don't mind sharing some of the plunder of this expanding American empire with some sections of the working class. But in the long run, that new deal was a deal because of the 30s, and we're not in that anymore. So over the next decades, they try to undo the new deal. Not try, to a large extent, they do undo uh, the new deal. But the, in the cultural sphere, educational sphere, um, it was very, very important to the elites. And they did this to a large extent consciously, to smash, crash, undermine the very powerful influence of the left, uh, not just in Hollywood, uh, first and foremost in the unions. There was a big campaign to purge the left-wingers out of the unions, and the uh, leadership of the AFL-CIO cooperated to, uh, with, with that purge. Uh, they purged teachers out of schools and universities, uh, and of course, Hollywood, they, they, they try to fire people out of in positions of government. And alongside of that was the Cold War. And, and I mean, I'm working on a project now with Daniel Ellsberg based on his book, Doomsday Machine. Uh, they needed an ex existential enemy. They really needed it. And, and they, you know, even when the Soviet Union got the bomb, uh, they knew that Soviet Union was actually not an existential enemy, at least not in military terms. But they were very afraid in ideological, cultural terms that this model of a worker's state uh, was possible. Now, and, and, you know, in the longer run, it, didn't, it wasn't what people believed it was. But in 1946, you know, this, everyone knew the Soviet Union was the one that broke the back of Hitler. And it was the Soviet Union that, that you, know, you know, when people were doing victory 
rallies in Europe after the fall of Hitler. They had you know, pictures of Stalin everywhere. You know, this was scaring the elite shitless. So a big campaign unfolds. And, and the way these things, I, I don't think it's necessarily some smart people in a room plan everything, but there is a certain amount of conscious planning to it. Certainly McCarthy saw an opportunity to push this Cold War craziness to advance his career. Uh, the House of Un-American Activities Committee uh, similarly saw ways to advance their own political careers. But the elites, you know, and, and they do have think tanks. They do have academics. They do have people that do think through these sort of things. They saw they needed to crush this enthusiasm for socialism and for, and for, for this kind of progressive politics. So, and, and, and along with it went leave it to beaver culture. This idyllic white families in the suburbs and you know the biggest problem they ever had is beaver fell off his bicycle and stubbed his toe. Uh, you know, this, this, this world that never actually existed gets portrayed on television and the media. And then it's accompanied by virulent, uh, crazy shows like I was a communist for the FBI, uh, which is that the Soviet Union is this evil empire that's going to come and invade the United States. They even had, you know, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. They're infiltrating your government. They're infiltrating everywhere. And they're going to use this missile advantage they have and blow us up that culture of complete fabrication of what america was gave birth to reagan and is a direct line to trump i wanted to comment real quick um, and this may seem out of the blue have you ever read the kurt vonnegut short story harrison bergeron no it, it's an interesting short story because uh it's about this society where uh, there's a handicapper general who's trying to make everyone equal and he'll like, you know, shoot people and make them equal. Uh, it's a very odd story for him to write because he was a Marxist. And the way we were taught it in school is that it was anti-communist. And later on, as I learned more about Vonnegut and his leftism, I thought, oh, this is actually, you know, him making fun of like, William F. Buckley style paranoia about, oh, if we do anything progressive, it'll turn into this communist dictatorship. It's sort of like he's making fun of that paranoia. Um, and we're sort of taught things like that story, or even when we're taught Orwell, we're not really taught about Orwell's sort of left wing uh, orientation uh, when it comes to how we learn about the Cold War. Well, as the left, we need to be kind of honest and balanced about what happened. I mean, it's a long story about the Soviet Union, but a single party rule and ownership of the means of production concentrated into that single party rule gave rise to what was to a large extent a police state. Now, people had more economic rights, in fact, than they did in the United States. And the right to a job and health care and education and higher education, it was all there. And, and in fact, in today's Russia, there's a lot of nostalgia for, the, for what existed in the Soviet Union. But there's no doubt that the Soviet Union, at the time, to try to build socialism in those conditions, gave rise to this extremely bureaucratic form of state. And eventually, it, it all implodes. It becomes so bureaucratized. Uh, because the conditions just didn't exist for it to do it the way it did it. I mean, at the speed of which they socialized. Uh, and we can get into that, but it's a long story. Uh, but so, so the problem, too, was a lot of the left for a long time uh, didn't know or just wouldn't accept. And I'm talking during the, you know, the 40s, the 50s, to, for some people even into the 60s, didn't want to accept how bureaucratized and how uh, repressive the state had become, or maybe was for a long time, not so much become, it was for quite a while. And, and sometimes for good reason, in the sense that because of the socialist revolution, you know, the West invaded the Soviet Union, and there was always attempts to overthrow the government there. So it's a combination of, 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 of repression 
because it's a one-party state, but it's also what happens when you're so threatened by external powers. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a complicated conversation. But we grew up with this notion that, that, that socialism is a repressive state that represents only those people that control the government. And the left, to a large extent, failed to deal with the truth of there, that there was some truth in it, which helped create room for the right to say, well, that's socialism. That's always going to be socialism. And so it's very important now. Like you started, you were mentioning this quote from Gore about the United States of amnesia. Later, he, even, he started calling it the United States of Alzheimer's. I th apparently, Studs Terkel came up with that. But uh, the, the lack of understanding, of, of a real understanding of history, although I would have to say, to a large extent, the vast majority of the population now has zero understanding of history, period, never mind <laughs> a realistic one. It, it, it's one of the most important things we need to do now. In that regard, how do you think the Cold War... What's the shadow of it? Because I think it casts a shadow over us. Oh, yeah. I think we see an almost Cold War-like mindset uh, with certain Democrats now with the whole Russiagate thing. Uh, and I think we definitely see it with Trumpism. There's this us versus them mentality where anything to the left of Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump is, you know, socialism. And they're coming to, you know... Take us away, haha. -ha. Well, you got to break it down. Uh, there's no doubt there's a shadow. I mean, this great quote from Marx about the, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but it has to do with the, these, these things of the past way like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Um, but the, uh, the Democratic Party corporate cold warriors, it's not quite the same as the Republican. Um, and, and the Republican are a little more obvious in the sense that I think most of the Republicans are just venal, uh, carry the water for the military industrial complex. And, and I think to some extent they know the things they call such threats are not really, um, and I, I just don't think they, to a large extent, this leadership of the of the Republican Party doesn't actually believe much in anything but making money. It's it's a, it's like Chomsky says they're they're a criminal gang, a criminal organization. The Democrats are a little more complicated. Um, one has to remember that take someone like Daniel Ellsberg. In 1949, not. I'm mean, sorry, into the later 50s, but including late 40s and into the 50s, right up until 60 or so, Daniel Ellsberg was a real committed cold warrior. He believed in his heart of hearts, as did most of his colleagues, that the Soviet Union was an, a, a threat for, to, the, to militarily dominate the world, and they were preparing to do so. They saw the Soviet Union... As, an, as the same threat as Hitler. And there's a whole generation of Democratic Party politics, starting with Truman, that you get this convergence of a belief that the Soviet Union is uh, an existential threat, militarily, and the rise and necessity for the military-industrial complex. Because after World War II, the economy was temporarily, you could say, out of the depression because of the war. But they were very afraid that without that kind of uh, government social spending on the war, you know, it's really a form of Keynesianism, stimulus, right? All that war spending. Um, that the economy would go back into the depression of the 1930s. So they needed to keep the militarization going. In fact, Ellsberg says that he thinks the nuclear war, ICBM strategy, uh, the whole nuclear pl plan, war strategy, was based on being, uh, he calls it, a subsidy for the aerospace industry. 
that the aerospace industry would have collapsed after the war if they are only going to make domestic aircraft. So there's an economic motivation here and a political ideological motivation to crush aspirations for socialism, for anyone to think that something socialistic is possible to achieve. They needed to crush that. A lot of these factors converge. It's, and again, it's not like necessarily anyone sitting there consciously understanding all this and making a perfect plan, but these realities reflect themselves in people's minds and consciousness, and they see opportunities, and it's the way the system works. So, so the militarization was and is a critical component to the uh, strength and expansion of the American economy, an unnecessary one. They could do the same social spending without it being military, and people like Bob, economist Bob Poland and others have modeled that it's probably 10 times the economic effect if you were, say, put the money into education rather than into the military in terms of stimulus spending. But because it's military and because it's such a bloody boondoggle of criminal criminality of, of profit making, and the Republicans are so into that, and corporate Democrats for that matter, because they all get you know, funding and donations and whatever, uh, that it forms a lot of their view. But where I was headed with this is, but, but for many of the Democratic corporate Democrats, and even you know, liberals who you might even not even call corporate necessarily on domestic issues. Their thinking is rooted in that idea that the Soviet Union and now Russia want to take over the world. And only this United States with all its faults stands in the way. It's not real, but it, 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 it won, it's, let me say this, it's convenient to believe it. It gives you a raison d'etre to support the military-industrial complex. And the, uh, to their shame and how wrong they were, the Democrats thought they could dredge up the demons of the Cold War and use this in, in the Russiagate stuff to bring down Trump and to their shock <laughs> found out that nobody gave a shit. <laughs> uh, you know, my line about Russiagate, I wasn't quite in the weeds on this stuff as some of my colleagues were, uh, I, I, my, uh, my thing on Russiagate always was, I don't care if Russia did everything they were accused of doing in terms of social media to support Trump. And maybe they did some, maybe they didn't. I honestly don't care. Because as a threat to American democracy, what the American oligarchy has done to undermine American democracy is so much worse that who cares? And, and the Russians did us a favor. If they really were the ones that hacked uh, WikiLeaks and exposed the undermining of, uh, not WikiLeaks, uh, Clinton's emails and the DNC. And we found out about the sabotage of the Sanders campaign. Well, then we should send them a thank you note. Uh, any rate, there's a, a lot of the corporate Democrats and even more liberals. For, I would say Bernie Sanders for quite a while had a foot in, in this old Cold War thinking. I think he's more and more out of it now. But I remember when he was running against uh, Hillary, he was talking about strengthening NATO. Uh, so like, like even people like Sanders, it takes, you know, that's, it, it, when you're formed in the Cold War, your thinking, your worldview, and you're talking, it's very important, the issues you're raising right now, the shadows of the Cold War, because the generation of leaders we have, uh, they're, 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 their very identities were formed in believing about these existential threats. And, and in spite of all its weaknesses, that the United States stands for something else, it's very hard to let go of that. Like I, I interview Larry Wilkerson all the time. You can't get a better critic of US foreign policy now. But Larry volunteered to go to Vietnam to fight communism and fought there. He was in the military for decades fully believed the Cold War mythology. And only during the time of the Iraq War did it, it, the coin really drop for him. Holy shit, this is just about money making. They, these people actually don't believe in anything. So it's, it's, it's gotta be understood that it's not just 
this kind of conscious manipulation to serve the military industrial complex. There's a piece of that. But it also is right in, in their belief system for many of these people. And, and, and it has to be fought, which is what, you know, one of the reasons I'm trying to do this doc, uh, documentary with Ellsberg. I know that we're talking in terms of the leadership, uh, but I also think there's this issue where I think a lot of voters, uh, especially ones who uh, may have lived through the Cold War, uh, were so propagandized uh, into this sort of it's us versus them uh, sort of paranoid style of American politics mindset. And I think we even got more of that um, with the war on terror that it's created this whole almost cultural phenomena where I, I think you've almost referred to it as like the the fascistization of um, culture. Could you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh well, let's go back to the wrestling film, because it's not a bad metaphor. A lot of people that watch wrestling, frankly, before my film came out, which kind of showed how much theater it was, it went past suspended disbelief. A lot of people thought wrestling was real. And, and you couldn't emotionally get into it if you didn't believe it was real, but it, it's meant to look real. It's, it's, it's very realistic looking fighting. Um, the Cold War, this mythology narrative of this Amer phony America that never existed. Now, it's not just the Cold War. Uh, this goes, I mean, you can talk about a false consciousness, a false identity. Let's go back to the slave society and then let's talk about the American Civil War. I mean, how many poor farmers who did not own slaves and workers joined the Confederate army and died in their thousands and thousands for an identity based on, well, at least I'm white. And I have to fight for the South, which meant white supremacist culture, even though these poor farmers and workers did not benefit except to walk around thinking, well, at least I'm not a slave. Well, that's true. But honestly, from an economic point of view, to some extent, they probably had more in common with the interests of slaves than with the, the plantation owners. So this false consciousness of Americanism, you know, you can see it right from there. And, and in many ways, what we're seeing today has its roots there. A new narrative emerges. Oh, we're freed the slaves. Now you can all be free workers and you can choose your own job and you're not a slave anymore. So what's the new narrative? The new narrative is wage slavery is freedom. You get to choose your job. Well, of course, you, you don't get to choose to be unemployed. You don't get to choose that your family is going to starve because you can't get a job or your wages are so low. But it's all dressed up as freedom. America's fur is freedom. I mean, this is an old piece of American mythology to get workers to believe that formal political rights are more important than economic rights. So they can, you know, look down at Cuba or, you know, for a time, even the Soviet Union or whatever, China's. And, for that matter, even these kind of more social democratic capitalist countries like the Nordic countries, you know, you, you can look down at anything that looks like socialism because I've got the right to vote. Um, it's, it, this false consciousness just gets on steroids during the Cold War. I wanted to add to that real quick. I've always said to people, uh, when I look at these figures like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders, I actually think what they're uh, advocating for, it, it's really not as far left as like some full on uh, communists. I know it, it seems like they're more in favor of uh, a sort of social democracy model like the Nordic countries you've mentioned. And to me, it's really telling because it seems as if we've gone so far right that now even the idea of social democracy is seen as you know, the farthest thing to the left. Well, Bernie Sanders 
if he if he had the kind of politics he has, the policy I should say he has here, would be a center center right social democrat in Europe. Now I'm not saying he is a center center right, because in those conditions he would probably be far more to the left. Because I just think that's who he is. Uh, I think the left has to start actually believing its own language, because I think a lot some of the left people that are very prominent talk about fascism and uh, the fascization and they talk about the empire and this and that. But in some ways, I don't think they actually believe it. What I mean by that, what I mean by that is you've got, we got to be realistic about what's possible in the heart of the empire. You know, Lenin had this thesis about weak links of the imperialist chain. That is the revolution. It was a, this was the this is the whole one of the biggest paradoxes, dilemmas of the 20th century. And I think Lenin was right about this. He said that where the conditions for social socialism exist in Western Europe, United States, exist because there's advanced capitalism. You actually can't get the workers to become revolutionary because there's so much money to be thrown around that they, they can actually bribe the leaders of trade unions and even whole sections of the working class, like in the United States, workers in the automobile industry and, and in the uh, transportation sector that could make such good livings that they just would not be revolutionary in terms of their aspirations. Whereas in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, where the conditions were so terrible, and the, and the capitalist classes and, and, and the ruling elites were, were weak and fractured, where revolutionaries, revolutions were really possible, the conditions weren't ripe for socialism because the economies were just too backward. And, and, there, and so it was a real paradox. And, and it's a, I don't know if you want to get into it, but you know, Lenin at first thought that you could do it, with a, a revolution and then and revolutionize things very quickly. And then he, st I think, started to realize, no, you needed more capitalist development. And then he dies and Stalin comes in and thinks you can just force, force the whole thing. There's this thing that I think has happened where, you know, as Thatcher put it, there is no society, only individuals. And I feel like that mindset has become utterly entrenched in our culture in a way that has led to a, a sort of fascistization. It's very hypo hypo hypocritical in a sense. While people are told all the time to be individuals and are told all the time, uh, you know, if you're not doing well, it's your fault and pull up your bootstraps. And if, you know, you, social solutions are socialist and, and big government, and that's going to be terrible and all that. On the other hand, what, what is the thing that's idolized most in America? NFL, NBA, team sports. And all, everything's for the team. And if one player has a big ego, you know, LeBron James, he gets, I don't say he has a big ego, but he gets accused of it. Maybe he does, I don't, it doesn't matter. You're, you're not a team player. I mean, it's such a joke. The most successful sports ventures in the country are the teams that play with each other best. And, and everybody knows it. And, and so, and, and every business, and you go to big corporations. Ah, you're going to be part of the team. Got to be a team player. I mean, all the values are about team when it comes to actually succeeding in something. But then they promote this crazy individualism when it comes to actual problems people are facing. It's it's just it's just part of just another one of these crazy contradictions of of Western and American culture, particularly. I mean, most of the other advanced capitalist countries get there has to be social solutions, uh, and, and 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 frankly, U.S. gets it too. It's just that most of their social social solutions are social solutions to benefit the rich. In that regard, how do you think – I think the left a lot of times in this country – and I, I think the left has been really damaged um, in in a lot of ways. It, it is in a difficult place, I think, uh, 
how do we break through a lot of the propagandization and this sort of fascistization uh, of our culture? Because I feel like any time you push back, uh, people get upset when you mention the contradictions. Uh, how do you break through that sort of cultural propaganda? Well, if I knew, I'd be. That's not an easy question. Well, I know. I, I, I know how to do it, but how do you do? I know how to do it, but how do you do it? Uh, so what I mean by that is, well, let me do the big picture first. Why? And you wanted to talk about Gore Vidal. Why in 1968 will ABC News do a debate with William F. Buckley Jr. And for your younger viewers, he's he's like the uh, smarter Tucker Carlson. Uh, why, why are, 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 not that Tucker Carlson isn't smart, he is, but he's just not as smart as Buckley. Uh, but why do you get a debate right in the midst of the Democratic Party National Convention when thousands of people are, are in the streets storming the place? The Democratic Party is up in arms, uh, I mean, the anti-war part of the party. How do you get a debate between William Buckley Jr. and Gore Vidal? Can you imagine that on television now where Gore Vidal will denounce the national security state? I'm not sure he used quite those words back then, but it was still more or less the same critique. I mean, someone with that kind of uh, stature and voice, um, you know, even somebody like Thomas Frank, you know, who wrote What's the Matter with, with Kansas, um, you know, he... he He's not at, not as famous as Gore Vidal was, but he you know he had a big book. He was very well read. You don't see him on MSNBC or CNN anymore. Why? Because he was critical of the Democratic Party, and he started to get shut out. Uh, in the political sphere and the cultural sphere, uh, especially political discourse, um, there's been a real degeneration. But you know, it's not just because something happened in the culture that made something happen in the culture. It's not like Reagan somehow won the argument and became president because his right-wing ide ideology convinced people or something. The determining power is finance. And that's been the case. The banks and finance essentially became the most dominant part of the economy and politics. Even by the late 19th century, uh, Morgan, J.P. Morgan was already structuring the economy in, in the 1890s, telling the railroads they better merge because they're getting too competitive with each other. His role as the banks gets even more powerful. Uh, the Fed gets created by the big bankers because they see the need for some level of uh, external regulation of the banking sector. Uh, by the 1920s, the banks are absolutely dominant. Why? Not because just because they're smart and they, they become dominant. Because when you have large-scale industry developing, you need massive amounts of capital to have thousands of workers and thousands of machines. This objective development, which partly just spontaneously developed out of the scientific technical revolution, mass production, machines, you know, understanding the natural world for, in terms of electricity and chemistry. This gives rise to modern industry. Modern industry gave rise to the need for massive amounts of capital, and the role of banks started to change. They're not like evil bankers. It's, it was a, a natural progression of how capitalism unfolded that banks and the finance sector became so critical and so dominant. And as they become more dominant, and of course, their only interest is to make money. They start wild speculation in the 1920s. Everybody should join the stock market. If you, don't worry, buy $100 a stock, $1 down, we'll loan you the other 99. Everyone in the whole, workers, everybody's asked, go buy stock, go buy stock. And it gives rise to crazy bubbles and manipulation. It's, it's one of the factors that leads to the crash in 2930. The uh, financialization of the society, which means the growing dominance of the banks, where exporting money and getting, meaning getting countries around the world in debt and paying interest back to the banks, 
getting people in the country in debt, paying interest to the banks, getting everything into short-term profits for the financial institutions that more and more own everything. Even Roosevelt talked about this. And I think it was a speech he made on monopolization in 37, I think it is. He talks about how, you know, we talk about the captains of industry. And he says, well, it's actually now becoming the bankers who are the only real captains of industry, something like that. This is back in the late 30s. This has already happened. So when capitalism, when America is expanding, Germany's laid waste, Japan is laid waste, uh, Soviet Union's laid waste. Japan, I mean, the, the, the opportunities for productive investment by the, in, in the U.S. economy is unparalleled. So American industry shoots like a rocket. Of course, it needs massive amounts of capital to do it. So along with the rocket of really productive industry filling the void, because it's practically the only one left that can manufacture stuff, Massive amounts of capital, finance starts to retake its position as the most powerful. I say retake because during the 30s, it was in trouble. And during the World War II, the government was spending so much money that the fi finances, banking share of the GDP was going down. But take a look at the share of GDP after the war's over. It goes up like a rocket. And when Reagan comes in, there's a second revolution takes place. And it's not the Reagan revolution that's the real thing. Reagan's a face of something else that's happening. It's the digital revolution. And the digital revolution, amongst other things, but to my mind, two of the most important byproducts. Number one, globalization on steroids. You start to have the Walmart phenomena. You start to, you know, you, somebody goes in and buys a tube of toothpaste off a, a shelf in Walmart, Somewhere in China, they know to make another tube of toothpaste. Like the global supply chain, it wasn't new. I mean, Jesus, colonialism, you know, in the 17, 16, 15, 1800s, I mean, colonialism was already a global market, global labor, cheap labor, raw materials, and so on. But what happens with the rise of uh, digitization, computers, it's globalization on high-tech steroids. I mean, this is the birth of high hyper-capitalism. It's not like, oh, let's have neoliberalism. I don't even like the term. It makes it, it sound like all of a sudden neoliberals won an argument, so now they're gonna, it's going to be their policy that wins. Neoliberalism is just the reflection in the minds of capitalists how to take advantage of digital, digitized globalization, meaning how do you play off cheap labor in China against more expensive labor in the United States? How do you weaken the American worker and weaken the uh, unions, and not just in the United States, Canada, Europe as well? Uh, so part of that process is because the workers get weaker and the unions get weaker, strengthens the balance of power between labor and workers in the United States and elsewhere, but most pronounced in the United States, then something else starts to happen. And this is another product of digitization. Wall Street, where most, you know, the lion's share of the profit of this uh, productivity, quote unquote, meaning forcing American workers to take less money and, and increasing profits. So, that, so there's new wealth, a tremendous amount of wealth created. More and more goes up to that 1%. And we've all heard the stats that Bernie's talked about and all the rest. Tremendous increase in the gap between the wealthy and everybody else. Well, you get to a point, and this is one of the great irrationalities of capitalism, it's, uh, which is it, it's insanity, that by weakening the American workers, what do they accomplish? Well, yeah, they make more money at the top, but they're undermining their own consumers. Who the hell's buying this stuff when they don't have wages? So they get into this craziness that they have so much wealth at the top. Demand's been weakened throughout the society. So what are you going to do with all this money? Speculate, gamble, you know, derivatives, subprime mortgages, you know, these fancy, fancy uh, uh, structured investments that hardly anybody can make any sense of what the hell they are. But guess what? 
You think you could do that with a pencil and paper? Digitization did something else. It created a whole nother level for shenanigans on Wall Street. I mean, high-speed quantitative traders. I mean, it goes on and on. So, so the thing that's important is, is that I think we all too much focus on the sort of, you know, the, the neoliberalism of Ronald Reagan and, and that, that these, the, 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 it, these are objective things that happen within the economy, within the society, reflected in people's minds, who see ways to take advantage of opportunities that arise, like computers and, and, and getting cheaper labor. But, but the, the key I'm getting to here, sorry for going on so long here, but what happens is finance not only becomes dominant, again, it becomes even more parasitical. It gets more and more delinked from productive investment into bullshit casino capitalism. And with that mentality, you have to rationalize it. And the rationalization is, you know what? I don't give a shit what happens to the society. Look how much money I'm making. And that's, what, what, isn't just, that... Just, just, let me just let me just one more sentence mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. That's the real kernel of how fascism and financialization are essentially the same process today. I guess in that regard, I, I wanted to stick on that point you made earlier. It, it seems as if, as if uh, this increasing inequity, uh, this increasing financialization, it, it sort of, you know, sows the seeds for everyone's self-destruction, including the people that are doing all of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I've said that many times. The system, they've become so irrational that they can't even defend their own interests. What I mean longer term, like the climate crisis is clearly a threat, existential threat to global capitalism. Clearly. They can't recognize, deal with it because the only solution is socialistic in character. You need government regulation. You got to ban fossil fuels. You can't rely on market mechanisms. So you look at BlackRock, the big asset manager, eight trillion bucks, you read their documents on climate stuff. They actually do recognize it as an existential threat. But they absolutely can't get out of their model. So like, I'll give you an example. BlackRock says they're going to uh, stop investing in companies who have more than 25% of their revenue in coal extraction. Okay? Two things here. First of all, their biggest investments are an index fund where they buy an entire index, which is filled with fossil fuel companies. Uh, somebody once asked uh, the, Larry Fink from BlackRock, well, you've got such clout. If you really want to get out of fossil fuels, why don't you tell the indexes to remove fossil fuel companies from the index? You got the clout. He didn't have an answer to that one. Then they have another type of investment. BlackRock invests in, in called discretionary investment, which is a lot of money, too. They're not just index investors. So there they can pick and choose what stock they want. So they say, in our discretionary investments, we won't invest in more, any company with more than 25% of coal in their, porf in their revenue source. Well, there's two pieces to this which are bullshit. First of all, the second largest coal producer in the country is also very multi-tiered and invests in many, many things. So while they are the second largest coal producer in the country, it doesn't represent 25% of their revenue. So BlackRock can keep investing. The second thing is, let's say BlackRock did pull out of them. Someone else is going to go buy their shares. It does, BlackRock knows that without government intervention and regulation and actual phasing out coal, that you can, through the market mechanism, it does even as powerful as BlackRock is, it would have no effect if BlackRock pulled out. Because like I say, other people will just buy it. But so, so as much as they understand that there is an existential threat, that their own system is at threat, their own children are going to be growing up in a world that you know, is going to be unlivable. You know the story of the, fo you know, the, 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 what is it, a centipede or something on the back of a fox trying to cross a river. And the, it says the, the scorpion and the frog. Yeah, the, 
yeah, give me a ride. And he, he has to poison it. And he says, because that's who I am. I, I, I will never forget this, if you want to understand the mentality of, of, cap, of these kinds of capitalists. Apparently, in tobacco companies who knew for years that tobacco caused cancer, if you wanted to rise as an executive in those companies, you had to smoke. You had to be part of that culture. But, but okay, you smoke. They let their kids smoke, knowing that it would likely cause cancer. But to rise as an executive in the company, because that's, you know, you start to embody the values of the institution you are. You know, it, you know, they used to say you are what you eat. No, you are how you make your money to eat. So when it comes to climate, even though they get it, and you can see it reflected in the Biden administration now, they are finally at least acknowledging it's a real threat. It's existential. They're using all the right language. Uh, you know, they stopped the XL pipeline and but they're still relying on market mechanisms pri primarily. Um, and they're still talking about carbon capture as if it's uh, you know, reliable, which any, I think everyone knows it certainly isn't in any foreseeable future that will mean something. But they, they, you know, it, it is who they are. And, and, but there, let me just end by saying maybe there's one hopeful moment here because people like Larry Fink and some others are really are starting to get the danger of climate, they seem to really be getting it. Maybe there is a space now where they're going to say, you know what, we hate the idea of it, but maybe we actually do need some government regulation here. They did it with, uh, what is it, the stuff that used to be in refrigerators. Uh, they had, hy hy not hydrochloric. I can't remember the, the chemical they used to as a cooling agent. Uh, I just did an interview with Patrick Bond. And he was referring back to the uh, Montreal Accords, where they actually did ban uh, these chemicals, and it, it was very effective. The acid rain in the lakes started to go away. Um, maybe there's a moment here where it's where it's possible under tremendous pressure, but their natural gravitation is you know they're the scorpions, and uh, it's who they are. Well, the, the logic of the market and, you know, the institutions themselves, uh, in a way, they have more sway over, you know, individuals in positions of power than the individuals have over those institutions and those sort of that logic of the market at times. I think that's maybe the point. And I think that's what sets the left apart from uh, the sort of, you know, far right. Uh, everything is like a cabal or a conspiracy. I think it's more structural how we look at these problems well it's both i mean the this this it's the structure is dominant but within the structure people are conscious and plan and and conspire <laughs> and uh but they only can do it within the structure they can't you know the, you know they, they exist within what's possible within those structures um but I mean, I, I've, I've really started to think, uh, you know, Ralph Nader used to say only the billionaires can save us, which I think was a bit of an exaggeration. But it, there's no doubt there are going to have to be some sections of the elites who really do get the danger of climate and, and, and understand that the market is not going to do it. Uh, the problem is the time frame. This is, this is the problem we're facing here. I have no doubt over time. The logic of socialism will win because the logic of capitalism is, is that capitalism is out of, out of speed. It's out of solutions. And over, the, over decades, more and more people will become conscious of that and it will, it, will, it will assert itself. The problem is we don't have time for what would be a normal evolution of the human society. Uh, like I've always uh, like, well, I've always thought of where we're at. You know, we're we're on a long journey from ape to human, and we're only part way there. We ain't hit real human society yet. Um, and capitalism is a stage towards a more real human society. 
Um, but we don't, you know, we got like 10 years not to hit 1.5 degrees. This is, this is the dilemma. And if you, if you work back from how do you get not to hit 1.5 by 2030, you can't do it without sections of the elites. So to me, it's, it's a kind of two-pronged strategy we have to be thinking about, and, and I'm sure many people are. One is the elites won't do much of anything without mass mobilization. There really has to be a powerful people's movement. But we also have to be mindful of not of, of trying to fracture the elites and get the more saner elites to get more dominant, stronger, both in terms of allies of the people's movement. And unfortunately, it's going to have to happen within the Democratic Party. There is no way a third party is going to emerge. I don't think anyway. I'd, I'd love to see it. I just don't think it's possible by in the you know within ten years. It, it, the uh, the mass base of fascism is very strong. Seventy four million people voted for essentially a fascist movement. I'm not saying they're all fascists. The seventy four million, far from it. But a large portion of that seventy four million have been really fascistized, and the rest of the people that voted for Trump were willing to vote in that direction, uh, out, of, out of desperation, out of cynicism, uh, nihilism, you name it, uh, or religious fanaticism. Uh, so, so what is possible within this decade? And I don't see how a third, now I don't mind, it's not like I object to people organizing third parties, especially at city and state levels, and especially in states that are dominated by the Democratic Party. And, and you're not going to elect Republicans anyway. So I, you know, I'm I'm all for third parties. Although I prefer primarying uh, Democrats because uh, that's where the battle is. I'll go back to what I said really earlier. Let's be realistic about what's possible when you're living in the heart of the empire. To think that you're going to have some great socialist revolution here. It's, it's, it's just, it's beyond utopian. The weak links are where maybe there's a possible breakthrough in India, uh, Brazil. Um, I don't know. I, I, the state seems too powerful in China for uh, that kind of breakthrough. Uh, maybe if some other places, I don't know. But the ones that would matter that could change the course of history are India and Brazil. And right now the left's pretty weak there too. Still very fractured. In closing, I guess the way I wanted to wrap this up, uh, we've went in multiple different directions. We've looked at the Cold War. We've looked at financialization. We've talked about uh, uh, the sort of war state and the national security state and, and the climate crisis. It seems like all of these things are coalescing. I feel like we have this rising uh, fascist right that in part uh, may be influenced by the, the really, in my view, horrible failures of the Iraq war. I think that really uh, changed a lot of people. Uh, and also, I think the increasing inequities. So we're seeing a destabilization happening in our culture, in our political arenas, where people are sort of fed up with the establishment. We have a, a climate crisis. The inequities between people are increasing. Uh, it really does seem like in some ways we, we may be seeing I don't know, maybe it's the decline of the empire, and that's the point I wanted to end on. Uh, you interviewed, uh, famously, Gore Vidal, and I, I feel like Gore Vidal's sort of view of where America was headed, you know, going from a republic to an empire, and now maybe it's on the decline, uh, had something to it. What do you make of Gore Vidal's analysis? Well, I think he was a little unrealistic about how quickly the decline would take place. Um, and he he was prone to some uh, prone to exaggeration. Like he he didn't think there'd be an election in two thousand and eight that you know Bush would find a way to carry on. Sort of what Trump wound up trying to do. Um, I the American Empire may be declining, but it's going to be a long if uh, left as it is without without something transformative happening amongst the people's movement. Um, which which I, w I hope is possible. 
Um, it could be decades and decades of decline. And we don't have decades and decades. Um, so, I mean, what I think needs to be done, but I'm this little voice off in the wilderness here. Uh, I think the Biden administration should be urged by progressives to viciously attack the far right. I mean with the state. And I don't mean by violating constitutional rights because they're breaking laws all over the place. They don't need to have new censorship laws. They don't need uh, uh, a new Patriot Act. In fact, we should get rid of the Patriot Act we had. They don't need big tech companies uh, deciding who gets to speak and who doesn't. But, but right now, I believe members of Congress, Mitch McConnell committed sedition and treason. Of course, Trump did. Charge them with sedition and treason. Cr treat them as criminals. Crash this Republican Party as much as possible uh, legally. Um, the 20%, uh, uh, well, let's start with the, 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 they should absolutely go after with great force. Uh, the, the militias and the far-right ar armed militias and such, uh, viciously clamp down on them. Um, they should purge the police forces of the racists and the fascists. Uh, and then they should bribe, I, I, I use that word to be provocative, every worker working in the fossil fuel industry in every Republican state. Promise them their wages will continue at the same rate they're getting paid now. If, we, if, if the Fed can just manufacture trillions of dollars to, to float the stock market, it's a pittance how much it would take to guarantee fossil fuel workers, and because you're guaranteeing them wages, all the spillover effect in the towns and the stores and the shopkeepers and all the rest that feel so threatened by decarbonization. You know, tell every fossil fuel worker in Pennsylvania or Kansas or wherever, Texas, you will not lose a penny in wages as we start to transform the society to one of sustainable energy. So send money into the red states. Let the workers say, holy shit, you know, they actually care what happens to us here. And clamp and crash down on the far right political structure. Uh, and, and, and say to the elites, you know, I, you know, like I wouldn't take on the elites on some things. For, for example, the wealth tax. Um, I, I, I asked Tom Ferguson once if the, if, if the elites, you know, the political economists, if the elites had to choose between a Bernie Sanders or a, a Trump, who would they choose? As crazy as Trump is. He said if, if Sanders tried to advocate a wealth tax of any seriousness, they'd rather have fascism. They'd rather have Trump. So uh, there, there's actually some things we need to be strategic about right now, especially at a time, and this is where we're in a weird moment of history. The elites don't seem to care how much money gets created. They really, you're hearing critics on Bloomberg radio saying the Biden package isn't big enough. I heard a, a banker saying it should be more like $4 trillion, not 1.9. So uh, we know why they want this, because they, they, they know they're going to be able to get a big sl slice of it. But they also see the problem of a complete collapse in consumer demand. So as much as they're into speculating, it's not like they don't want any consumer demand. They, they don't want the economy to crater. So it's, a, it's an interesting moment now where there actually might be some space for a, a real green infrastructure plan and enough money to subsidize sections of the working class uh, that have been, you know, taken in by Trumpian politics. Uh, just, just to add to that, and then I, I promise to let you go because I've kept you over. Uh, what's your opinion with regards to the wars abroad going forward because i've been thinking about that a lot more lately sometimes i think we on the left haven't talked about it as much as maybe we did when i was growing up first discovering my sort of leftist political inclinations during the bush years 
Um, sometimes I feel like we don't talk about foreign policy as much. What is your take on where foreign policy is headed? And I want to thank you for having uh, people like Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson on uh, your program uh, to discuss those matters. Well, as you know, on the analysis, I probably do more foreign policy than I do domestic stuff. Uh, well, partly because it's needed where there's other people doing a lot of the domestic critique. Um, well, Wilkerson once put it in a good way, I thought, a realistic way. The elites, the American elites have to either, well, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to accept the decline of a single superpower world, that it's a multipolar world, accept it, and in a conscious way, transition to it. And obviously, that's primarily about how to deal with China, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, or, and there's a section of the elites, the most overt spokesman for this section is Steve Bannon, who talks about a bloody war to defend Western Judeo-Christian civilization. He used to focus on Islam, but now the focus is really on China. And, and, and Bannon has actually advocated uh, a military confrontation of some kind in the South China Sea. But Bannon's not way out there. Uh, Richard Haas, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations, he's advocating that Biden should take a strong position that if the Chinese ever militarily move towards Taiwan, that the United States will absolutely intervene. Right now, that's not the American position. The American position is it's a real bad thing if China intervenes in Taiwan. Don't do it. It's going to make us really mad. <laughs> but there's no promise of military intervention. And uh, the crazies out there from John Bolton's, the neocons, including all the neocons that supported Biden, not just the neocons around Trump, they, they're willing to risk going to the edge with China for several reasons. There's always the reason of you need an existential enemy for the military industrial complex, but that's, that's not, that's a propaganda uh, feature of the issue, a real one, but not, by, not the only one and perhaps not even the main one. China is a growing state capitalist power that already, you know, in terms of the size of its economy and, and, and such, rivals the United States and, and will surpass it. Uh, the Americans are very concerned that China will so dominate Asian markets, at least to begin with, um, that they might start getting shut out of them. Um, and it's a terrible quandary for the U.S. because as much as they want to push back on China, American corporations can't give up access to the Chinese market. So what do they do? No good answer to it. Um, China has a massive, massive, disciplined, cheap workforce. How do you compete with that? China's brilliantly uh, you know, picked off intellectual property rights and te technology know-how, and now are developing their own, that is surpassing the Americans in some spheres. So it's, without question, it's the, every foreign policy question right now for the United States comes back to China. Uh, whether it's, I mean, why does the United States give a damn what happens in the Middle East? I mean, the United States doesn't even need Middle Eastern oil anymore, but China does. So as a strategic asset, the Middle East matters in terms of the rivalry with China. It is in the nature, the fundamental nature of modern capitalism or call it imperialism, to strive for as much global dominance as you can get. Um, it's the same problem as, you know, we're talking about with climate, you know, like it's kind of is who they are. On the other hand, Larry Wilkerson says, and this is what's different about this era of capitalist competition, every war game that the Pentagon that Larry knows about was ever conducted about what happened if there was a military confrontation in the South China Sea that grew into some level of conventional military 
confrontation. Every single one of them ends up in nuclear war. The war game. They have to stop. They have to cancel the war games because, you know, the world's over. There's no point doing it any longer. We're into nuclear winter. So we're in a weird moment here where there aren't the kind of normal moves that the elites would normally make, which means, you know, forget about climate, pursue the rivalry with China, even if it means war, because if it was conventional war, they wouldn't give a shit. What do they care? So tens of millions of people die. Well, these are the same people that firebombed Japan and firebombed, dropped nuclear weapons and, you know, Vietnam, they killed millions. I mean, they don't care about killing millions of people. And that's Democrats and Republican leadership. So it's not just a moral shift. But they're in a position now where there's real existential threats, climate and nuclear war, which means they can't do, they can't keep doing business as usual. And if there's a powerful enough people's movement, maybe enough of the elites get it. Or to be, you know, really honest, or we're we're doomed. Well, that's that may be a, a darker note to end on, but I think it's also an honest one. Uh, is there anything else you want to say? I try to end on a positive note, and I also want to give you a uh, chance to let listeners know how they can check out your work at theanalysis.news. Uh, go check out theanalysis.news. It's on the web. You know, go to the website um, and see what you think. Um, end on a positive note. I got to honestly think about how to end on a positive note, but I'll do it the way Ellsberg does. We got to act, though we might be on the Titanic. I'm quoting Ellsberg here. Only three compartments have filled with water and and a crucial one or two are left. Um, There is still time, actually, in this snare story to turn the Titanic away from the iceberg. We have to act that way. Because if you give in to despair, uh, then we're definitely hitting the iceberg. And do I think we can avoid the iceberg? And the answer is, I don't know. But there's no choice but to act as if we can. And I'll just say one final note. One of the ways I think we need to act, especially on the left, is we really got to stop all the attacks on each other, the the sectarianism. It's one thing to argue over policy, which we should, but to start attacking people and using these, you know, names. uh, You know, the, the objective has to build a broad united movement and everything has to be judged. Does it help build that broad movement? And, and if it doesn't, it's, it's very negative. Do I think we can? I work backward from this point of view. Humans have always gotten through the worst of stuff. You know, who would have thunk if you were in a concentration camp in World War II that humans would ever have gotten out of World War II? But we did. So far, humans do pull through. So we better act as if we, we will and, and, and try to make, make it so. Well, thank you again, Paul J., for coming on Parallax Views. Thank you. Give yourself. Uh, hey, okay. I, I'm going to run this interview too, so give yourself a plug so people know how to find oh, your, your, uh, your piece. Parallaxviews.podbean.com. I think Paul and I have a lot of uh, overlapping guests. I've actually got a few guests from you, uh, like Lawrence Wilkerson. And uh, Thomas Ferguson, I discovered through your show. So I'm very thankful for that. Well, thanks for doing the interview. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Keep up the great work, too. Thank you.